I was born in Poland in 1925. And when I was five years old, my father was called into the Polish army. When Jews were called in the Polish army, they usually disappeared. So they did terrible things, you know, they cut their fingers, they blinded themselves just so that they could escape the army. Father didn't want to do that. He had a sister who had left for Belgium, was in business in Belgium, and he decided he was going to leave the country and go to Belgium. Left my mother and me behind and came back about three months afterwards and said to my mother, you know, I can go into business there. It's wonderful. We're moving. So she decided she would leave me behind and go and establish a home in Brussels, which she did, and she came back for me. I was five years old at the time, and uh, I had a wonderful life in Belgium, wonderful. But my grandparents passed away, and they left uh, a flour mill and an oil refinery to the three children. So every couple of years, my mother would go back, or we would go back to Poland uh, to get the profits out, because the children would divide the profits and went back to uh, Brussels. We had, ultimately, we had to smuggle the money out because Poland froze the export of money. So comes 19, 39, and we're in Poland, and we get a phone call from my uncle in Brussels. He said, you better get home. The Germans aren't going to invade Poland. And we did it, and we doubt it, and we thought, ah, you know, we will, we won't. And before we know it, we wake up in the morning, and the bombs are falling, just like that. Uh, Konin, where I was born, is very much on the border of Germany and Poland. So we knew, we didn't realize how great that German army was. So we thought, oh, we have plenty of time to flee. We'll go to Warsaw, and maybe from Warsaw we can find a way back, or maybe uh, the Polish army would hold the Germans back. Uh, never did we dream the power of Germany, because within two days, they were just this far from cunning. And by that time, there was no way of getting gas. We thought, how are we going to get to Warsaw? We'll escape to Warsaw and wait out the war there with the family. Well, since we were in the uh, flower producing business, we knew a lot of the uh, farmers who came to us with the grain to be made into flour. So my uncle went uh, to one of them and he bought two horses and uh, four horses and two wagons. And we packed up things and started on our way to Warsaw. And that was a journey from hell because the roads were just jammed with people fleeing in both directions. People from the west thought they'd go east and people from the east thought they would go west. Every morning the Germans would come and machine gun us on the road. It wasn't bad enough. We, there was no food to be had. No food, no medication, no nothing. The, the road was here the houses and, and the farms were here, and everything was up in flames. No water, no food, no medicine, no schools, nothing. Uh, and again, the only way we survived is in the morning, very early, we would run out into the fields and dig up potatoes and dig up whatever was growing there and eat it raw. We even went into pig pens and got food out of pig pens to eat. They didn't care. They came and machine guns on the ground. When they machine gunned the roads, 
the horses got frightened and the people thought they were safe hiding under the wagons. But when the horses got hit, they went crazy. And if you didn't get killed from the bombs, you get killed from the horses who trampled you. That was everywhere, on the roads, on the lampposts, everywhere. There was nobody there to take care of it. And this lasted for about four or five days, and we were marching towards Warsaw. We thought that would be our salvation. Uh, it got to the point where, and when I say we, I don't mean just me and my parents and my family. I mean thousands of us. After about four or five days, it got so bad, we thought, we have to stop. We have to ask for help. We knew it was going to cost money. We had money. We had jewelry. We took that with us. And so that particular night, we stopped at the farmhouse and asked them for help. And they said, yeah, but it's going to cost. I said, fine. So they let us stay in the barn. And they brought us some milk and some eggs and some bread. And we slept in the, f in the barn. Now, hundreds of people did the same in that village. And when we woke up in the morning, we heard uh, German tanks. And they stopped and started screaming, everybody out, everybody out. So everybody got out of all the farms. They lined us up on, on the road. and. Before you knew it, it, they started yelling, Jews over here, non-Jews over here. And of course, my family started moving towards the Jewish side. And my father said, no, we're going over there with the non-Jews because we have passports. Most countries, if you were a Jew, on your passport, on the first page was a big red J. Belgium didn't have that. So we were safe. You know, there was no way that they could tell that we were Jews. They could tell by our families because the Hasidim, this was the ultra Orthodox, wore the habit and they had the long beards. So there was no problem. They could tell a Jew from a mile away. And my father said, let's go over to the non-Jewish side. We have our passport. By the way, I have that passport. Um, they stood, they watched, and then they said, we want 10 Jews over there. And they counted 10 men with beards, took them over to the tanks, tied their beards to the back of the tank, and dragged them through the streets. That was for sure. Then they came out, they cut off the beards, and left, and left the dead. So we only had one thing we could do, and that was to bury our dead. And we thought, OK, now we better hurry up and get to Warsaw. In the meantime, people coming from Warsaw said, no, you don't want to go to Warsaw, because they are bombing it to the ground. Uh, they're marching on us, hide, do whatever you can, don't go to Warsaw. Well, my mother's family said, we have family in Warsaw, it's a big city, we're going. And my father said, no, we're not going to Warsaw. They're going to destroy Warsaw. We're going back to Lodz, which was his birthplace. He said, in Lodz, they're not going to destroy anything because it's an industrial city. They need the industry. They're not going to destroy it. And he was right. So they went on to Warsaw, and that was the last time we saw them. Every one of them perished. We went to Lodz, back to Lodz. Found our family there. They put us up. And within a week, same story. The tanks came, Juden raus, Jews out, Jews out. They would line the people on the street, come into the houses, bang up the furniture, take everything of value, 
Same story, 10 Jews over here, bang, bang, and they left. So we thought, okay, they've come, we're safe now. They won't come back. Well, a week later, they were back. And at that point, our family said, look, even with your passports, you're not safe here. They'll come back, they'll keep coming back. We have friends, they were in the textile business. We have friends, uh, non-Jewish friends, who live in the suburbs. And we'll see if they will put you up. Well, that is easily said than done. First of all, Poles were notoriously anti-Semitic, whether they were your friends or not. And Germany had a rule. If you hide a Jew, you die with him. You and your family. So who's going to put up a Jew? Well, some people did. And we did. Our family did find a family that was willing to hide us. They lived in the suburbs. So we snuck over there and they hid us. I can't remember how long. It wasn't too long. And one morning my mother woke up and she said, you know, I heard that Himmler is coming to Lodz to establish a government here, a German government, which was not unusual because Hitler would send some of his top people to different big cities to establish a German government. My father says, what are you talking about? She says, I don't know, I heard. He says, where did you hear it? I don't know, I heard. She says, I'm going to take Stefanka, I'm going to go and see him, and we're going to get out of here. And my father said, they're going to kill you. She says, we're dead anyway. What difference does it make, sooner or later? So she got me dressed, got herself dressed, took the passports. We got on the streetcar and went to German headquarters. Got off the... Uh, the, tr the uh, tram, and we went to the building. A soldier was standing there with a the bayonet. He said, why, what are you doing here? And my mother said, well, we we'll have an appointment to see Herr Himmler. She was a very brilliant, clever woman, and she knew the German mentality. If you even suggested that you knew a superior officer, they would not argue with you. So he said, well, just a minute, I'll come back. He leaves and he comes back and he says, follow us. And we followed him into this huge, beautiful building, into a room larger than this apartment. On the walls were posters of Hitler. Long live Hitler, Heil Hitler, long live Germany. Down with the Jews, pictures of Jews hanging from lampposts. Uh, and my mother was a little uh, scared. I won't say scared, but she was a little wondering, did she do the right thing? And she told me, she says, now I speak German fluently, I speak French fluently, you speak French, and you speak Yiddish. You understand German, but you, for the time being, no, only French. That's your language. Do not even indicate that you understand what we are saying in German, because then he'll figure we're Jews. Jewish and German are very similar. And I promised her I would. So we're standing there, and about five, ten minutes later, this German officer marches in tall, handsome man uh, with the Gestapo uniform, the black uniform with the guns and uh, the decorations. And he's standing in front of my mother. She's a little gal like me, and he's six foot tall. He looks down on her, he says, what do you think you are doing here? What do you come for? And in her best German, she looked up at him and said, is this the way an educated German officer speaks to a lady? And he turned purple. 
and said to her in German, please excuse me, please excuse me. But the war does something to a human being. I want you to have a seat. And he seats us in front of his desk. He goes behind the desk. He said, now, what is it that you want? What can I do for you? And she says, well, we're Belgium residents. We've come to this godforsaken country. We want to get out of here. We hate this government. We hate this war. We want to get out. We want to get back to Belgium. He says, well, if you hate this country, what are you doing here? And, oh, she was so smart. She said, I have rheumatoid arthritis, very badly. And in Poland, there is a town called Czechochinek that has these stinking baths, mud baths. And my husband brings me here every couple of years to help my rheumatism. And we came this year and we got caught. Well, she was a step ahead of him because we did come every other year, but to get the money out. And of course, in the passport, it would show entry, exit. So he said to her, may I see your passport? And he looks at the passport and he looked at her and he said, you're a very clever woman, aren't you? And she says, yes, I'm a very clever woman. He said, all right. Why isn't your husband here? He says, oh, my husband had typhus, which is a very contagious disease, deadly. She said, my husband is just recuperating from typhus, and I didn't want to bring him here and expose all the German high command to typhus. He said, all right. He says, now, when are you ready to leave? And she said, we're ready to leave tomorrow. Today, any day. He says, would you be scared if you were in the presence of a large number of Germans? And she says, not really, if I had permission from you to leave. He said, just a moment. He left. He comes back. And he said, there is a German troop transport. 3,000 German soldiers are leaving Poland from Lodz to go back to Germany on a short furlough. I will vacate a first-class first compartment for you and your family, but you have to be ready first thing tomorrow morning. Do you have a way of getting the, to the railroad station? She says, no. So he called his adjutant. He said, tomorrow morning at such and such a time, you escort this family, vacate a first class compartment on my orders, put them in there, make sure they're safe. And he said, let me have your passport. And I forgot to bring it out. Now, if you will go into my bedroom, the, yeah, know, on the left hand side, there's a um, a dresser, and if you open the drawer, you'll see there's a little package with a passport in it. Okay. Anyway, he wrote this long thing and stamped it and handed us uh, coupons because if we wanted to buy food or even water, we had to have coupons. And he said, I wish you good luck and we will see you in Brussels very shortly. And so we went back. And he says, do you have a way back? I said, no. He got his adjutant to come. And the adjutant uh, took us back to where we were, picked us up the next morning, put us on the train with 3,000 <laughs> German soldiers into this compartment. Now, in the first class, there were only the very high-ranking German officials. They couldn't figure out who were these three people that they are demoting us out to stand in the passageway, and they're sitting there in first class. 
So they didn't say anything or do anything until we were underway. Then they knocked on the door and asked politely if they could come in and see us and talk to us. And my mother again said, everybody's quiet. I speak German. I have to talk to them. And they all sat down and wanted to know who we were, where we were from. Uh, they wanted our name, our address in Brussels, because they were coming very shortly, they would see us in Brussels. They were going on furlough, so a lot of them had looted Jewish homes, and they had, most of them had toys with them that they were bringing back to their children. So they started offering me these toys. And I looked at my mother, and she says, take them and thank them. And she knew I didn't want them because I knew they were taken from Jewish children who they had probably murdered. I didn't want them. But she was smart enough to know I better not start fussing. So I took the toys. When we got to Brussels, I threw them away. But in the meantime, I did take them. Now, this is the passport that saved us. And this is what he wrote. We, could ne we couldn't read it, we couldn't figure it out. This is his stamp, this is permission to leave the country. So we did, we finally arrived in Brussels. Have you had somebody translate that since? Um, we could, I had several people, his handwriting was so difficult that we couldn't until about two or three years ago. Uh, we had a, a young man who was here with the Jewish agencies from Germany. He was doing a fellowship here, and he translated it for us. I do have the translation, giving us permission to leave the country. We only have 24 hours to leave the country, and uh, not a word about us being Jews, nothing like that. So. Uh, and this is my mother's passport. My father's is at the uh, Holocaust Museum in Cincinnati. Uh, they wanted a copy, so I did give them this one copy. Anyway, we arrived in Brussels, and we told the family, we've got to leave. We close up the shop and take our money and go to France because they're going to be in Brussels, and France has a Maginot line, and they'll never take France. And again, we dilute, and we doubt. I went back to school, and I was supposed to go on a trip with my school to Holland in May. Comes the night before I leave for Holland, I'm all packed, I'm all excited, I'm ready to leave. I wake up in the morning and I say, gee, we're supposed to be leaving and it's thundering, but the sun's shining, something's funny. So I went to the window and opened the window and I heard what I thought was thunder, bombs. I remembered the sign of bombs in Poland. So I knew immediately those were bombs, not anything else. Rushed into my parents' bedroom and started yelling, Mommy, the Germans are coming, bombs are flying. She said, you're having nightmares again. You go back to bed, everything is all right. No, I screamed and I yelled. My father woke up. He says, what is all this commotion about? And she says, oh, she's having one of her nightmares. And he said, no, let, let me see. And he turns the radio on, pulls the window up, and at that moment, Belgium is declaring war. We've been attacked by Germany. All men have to report to duty. So we said, OK, now we, we really have to hurry and get out. Now, we had a big car, but we didn't know how to drive. We had a chauffeur for years. So we called the chauffeur. We said, you come here immediately. We're leaving for Paris. Then the men decided to go to the bank to cash some money. And also, we had money and jewels and 
things in the vault. They came back and they said, unpack everything that isn't absolutely necessary. Take only jewels, take money, take silver, whatever has any value, because the bank never opened. So whatever we have in the safe is gone. So we unpacked the things we thought we would only need for weeks or months, and we started packing. One of the things we packed were these candlesticks that belonged to my great-great-grandmother, Russian candlesticks, and a few other little items, whatever we thought was of value, and the jewelry. My mother had beautiful jewelry. My aunt had beautiful jewelry because one of our family were the head of the diamond exchange in Antwerp. So of course we had jewelry. We took that. And we got in the car and drove towards uh, Paris. We got to the French border. The military was there and they said, are you Jews? And he said, yes, we're Jews. He said, turn around and go back. We don't want you. We said, no, we're not going back. He says, you're not coming into France. Go back. Well, my father and my uncle got out, and they talked to one of the officers, and they said, you know, if the men join the French army, the women and children can go. And we said, no. The women will not separate from the men. They said, OK. Then go back. No, won't go back. Finally, another officer came out, and he said, you know, if you donate 10,000 francs per family, your two families, 20,000 francs, uh, to the French Red Cross, we'll let you go to Paris. Uh, my father knew it wasn't going to the Red Cross, but we didn't care. We knew it was going in their pockets. But who cares? You know, you, you want to save yourself. So we did. We gave him the money, and we went on to Paris. And we got to Paris. It was crazy. Thousands and thousands of people were in Paris. There was no hotel, no motel. There was no place to put your head down. Finally, we found an, a pension, which is a boarding house. And we were able to get two rooms. So we, we didn't unpack. We left everything in the car. And we went in to sleep, and in the morning, my mother wakes up screaming. She says, pack, we're out of here. We're out of here. And my father says, are you crazy? What's going on? She says, look. And there were bed bugs and roaches crawling all over the place. She says, I can't live like that. We're getting out of Paris. So here again, we pack up. And we said, where are we going to go? She says, well. Let's go to the south of France, the very south of France, because the French army is not great, but they're better than the Polish army, and they have the Magilo line. I don't think they're going to get as far as the south of France. So we packed up again, and to get from Paris to Dax, which is the very last city <laughs> in France, it's a resort town. We had to cross the Pyrenees Mountains. When we get halfway up the Pyrenees Mountains, the driver stops the car. And I remember he'd been our chauffeur for over 15 years. He wasn't Jewish. He knew we were Jewish. He stops the car and he said, now, you Jews are going to pay me, because if you don't, you're going to stay right here in these mountains and die. I'm going. So what do you do? Okay. Forked off money. He took us back. And we ended up in Marseille, uh, where we tried the American consulate to see if we could get passage to America. Uh, thousands of people were standing in line in every consulate. Uh, the American, the South American, anywhere, take us. Nothing doing. So we thought, OK, uh, we'll go back to Dax. So we went back to Dax, and then we heard that the Germans 
had crossed the Maginot Line, they were marching, and they would be in docks in no time. So again, we thought, and when I say we, again, it's hundreds of us, thousands of us. We said, okay, we're on the border of Spain. We'll flee into Spain. Again, everybody on foot this time, marching, bicycles, old people, they were carrying old people in, in, in baby carriages, carrying the babies in their arms, but the older people, they put them in a carriage. That's the only transportation we had. And the border of France and uh, Spain is on a, on a bridge and a river. So here thousands and thousands of us are stuck on this bridge. It's hot, it's summer. Again, no water, no food, no toilets, no medicines, nothing. And we're stuck there for days, begging them to let us come across. Now this is already Jews and non-Jews. No, nope. we're just getting over a uh, civil war and there is no way that we can accommodate you. Turn around, go back. No, Germans are coming, the Germans are coming, we can't do that. And after about three or four days, uh, an officer came with a bullhorn. And he said, we have made a pact with Portugal. They will take all of you. They will send Portuguese trains to this point here. You will enter the trains, we will lock the windows and lock the doors so that you can't exit when we stop for water and food. You won't be able to skip and stay in Spain. You'll all be going in transit to Portugal. And we were some of the first ones to get on the trains, packed like sardines. We got on the trains, they took us directly clear across Spain to Portugal. In Portugal, thousands of people came off the trains and this little nothing country was so organized. They said, people with money in this line, people with no money in this line, we will lodge you, we will feed you for as long as it takes to find a place for you. People with money over here. We've made arrangements with mostly uh, places that have casinos. There was a big casino in Estoril, world renowned. Uh, and there are other places uh, that we have. And if you can afford it, you'll be placed in nice hotels and nice boarding houses. And we still had some money left at that point, so we ended up in a little town called uh, Korea. And in Korea, there was a fabulous hotel uh, where people, rich people from all the world came. It was close to the casino. And we stayed there for just a few weeks, and then they moved us permanently to Porto. Uh, which is in the north of Portugal, and uh, they had apartments for us. They gave us identity cards. We had to report once a month to the police station with our identity card, which they would stamp. They wanted us to be safe, but they didn't want us to roam around and get lost in Portugal. So we were there for quite a while, and then winter came, and Porto is very cold in the winter. And they said they would transfer us to Lisbon and Estoril because there was room there for thousands of us, not just from Porto, from other northern cities. So they transferred us to uh, not to Lisbon, but to where the casino was, which is a suburb of Lisbon. And again there we met hundreds, thousands of other refugees, 
Jews, non-Jews, and, and there were meetings every day, every other day. Where did you go? What countries shall we apply for? And what are our chances? Everybody came up with ideas. And our parents ran from one city to another to one, uh, well, close by where they could reach in Portugal, where there was uh, an American embassy, where there was a Swiss embassy, where there was a Chinese embassy. No way. There was no way. Nobody wanted us. Then the American consulate came out with a needed, and they said, if a family can show that they have $3,000, or the equivalent of $3,000, per member in the family, we will give you passage to America. Well, that was 7,000 miles, and a year or so later, most of the money was gone. We did have some jewelry left, we did have some money left, some people had a lot of money left. Some people had no money left. So we formed, the Jewish refugees formed a little organization. And they came up with a scheme. And I, my father was asked to be one of the group that was going to head this organization. They said, you know, let's pool our money. You give us your money, we'll give you a receipt for it, then we'll deposit the money in the bank. And when family A, three, needs $9,000, we'll go to the bank, we'll withdraw $9,000, we'll give you the money, you go to the consulate, boom, boom, you're in, you got the money. And this lasted for a while, it worked. Americans, State Department got smart. They said, uh-uh, these Jews, they haven't got the kind of money. Something is going on. From now on, you stamp the money. You can't use it again. So this organization said, well, this is the end. Now the game's over. And everybody come tomorrow morning to the bank and present your receipt, and we will give you back your money. Everybody rushed to the bank, and as they were Walking in, the uh, head of the bank comes out and he says, what's going on? Why are you withdrawing your money? And they said, well, they're stamping our money. We can't use it again, so it, the game's over. He said, not by a long shot. We have millions of fresh American dollars. You give us your stamped dollars and we'll give you fresh dollars. The game's back on. And then my mother, for some reason or other, I don't know why, she was going through a bunch of stuff that she had, and she found a little address book. She looked at it and she said, you know, we have cousins in America. I don't know who they are, but this is their name. They're in a city called Cincinnati. And I don't know who they are, but it's their address. Let's write to them, because if you had a sponsor, you could come. They would guarantee that you would not become a ward of the state. They would guarantee that they would support you. We wrote to them, and back came a letter. We'll do anything, anything and everything to get you back to America. We'll fill papers, we'll send money, whatever. And that was the Cohen family. And they did. And it took about a couple of months before we were able to book passage for the United States of America. We arrived in New York, spent the night at the hotel, got on a train for Cincinnati the next day. We arrived at the new station, this beautiful new station, and the entire Cohen family was there.
with flowers, with candy. It was four brothers, their wives, their children, and their grandchildren. They were all there, the entire Cohen family. And they made arrangements for us to stay with one of the brothers. And this is how we got to America. And Maybell was married to the son of one of the cousins, Leon. Morris was his father, Morris Cohen. Leon Cohen was the son, Maybell was the wife. And now Maybell lives on the same floor around the corner. Wow. I started my life with Maybell in the United States and most probably will end my life with her. What a story. That's my story. There's a lot more, but I know you have unlimited time. Uh, I have not unlimited time. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them well, if so I can. Over the years, you were obviously I was 14. 12, 14? Okay. I was 14. She already was married, and she already had um, children. And then at what point did you lose touch, and at what point did you guys find each other again? Well, we never lost touch because my father, uh, they owned a safe supply company, which was a plumbing and a heating supply company. And they gave my father a job. Now, we didn't speak English. We didn't have a trade. My, husband, my, my father was a businessman. Uh, what can he do at the safe supply? All right, he swept the floors and he put merchandise away and he loaded merchandise and they also owned some property and they had an apartment vacant which they furnished for us and enrolled me in school and after oh probably a year my father and mother said this is not for us we're not getting anywhere we've got to buy a business We've got to get back on our feet. And we had about $3,000 saved up, and we did. They found a hardware store in the West End called West, uh, West End Hardware, owned by a German who had been the boss and owned the place for years and years, and he was ready to retire, wanted to sell the business. My mother says, what do we know about plumbing and hardware? My father says, we'll learn. And so they spoke very little English still, so I already was speaking fluent English, so they, we got in a cab and we drove down to the West End Hardware on Lynn and Poplar met the man and he took a liking to my parents and he said, you know what, I'm asking a fortune for this store because I've made a fortune. If you want this store, I'm going to sell it to you for the inventory and I will stay with you for three months and I will teach you this business. Well, we were short of money. We didn't have enough money to buy the store. So somebody says, go to the bank. You can go to the bank and borrow money. <laughs> so we went to the store and borrowed, uh, to the bank and borrowed money. And they look at us like we were crazy. He says, you have no money. You don't speak English. You're going to buy a store. How are we going to give you credit? We can't do that. You have to have a cosigner. What's a cosigner? Well, somebody who guarantee if you don't pay, they will. <laughs> so we went back to the Cohen boys and we said, can you co-sign? And they said, yeah, we'll co-sign. And they co-signed. And in three years' time, we had saved up enough to pay off the bank, tear up the mortgage, and we were on our way. And they made a fortune in that hardware store. Is it still open today? Uh, they retired after 15 years. In the meantime, we got into the real estate business. We started buying 
cheap property in the West End. They had no toilets, they had no running water, and we had plumbers and electricians who owed us money. So we told them, okay, you go to work, you remodel these places, you put in water, you put in toilets, you put in electricity, and pay off your debts. So property we bought for maybe $15,000 was worth three times that. And it didn't cost us that much to have it upgraded. So we did. We, we formed a company. My, my parents and I, I was married already. My parents and I formed Jackson Realty Company. Uh, after my son's name is Jack. Jackson Realty and uh, we started selling off the property in the West End and we started buying better property, nice property. Roselawn and uh, Bond Hill. Uh, then we went into commercial uh, leases. And after 15 years, my parents retired quite wealthy. Mm -hmm. That's my story. American dream, right? Yeah, my American dream. Come true. Now, I mean, it's been so long. You, you retell the story uh, so vividly. Does it make you emotional thinking back, or have you relived it so many times and the time has passed that it seems so um, distant? We never spoke about this for years. I never remember my mother smiling or laughing in all these years. She'd lost everybody, an entire family. My father had a very large family, and a few survived. And it was, it was very hard in the beginning. We'd, we didn't even talk about it. It was gone. It was in the past. And I was married. I had children. I had grandchildren. You know, life began to bloom again. They were able to retire and travel, and what a wonderful country, what a wonderful life we had here. And then I found out that uh, there was going to be uh, a Holocaust Museum opening up in Cincinnati. And I got in touch uh, with uh, the people who were forming that uh, museum. And I told them I, I wanted to be part of it. And so we did. We uh, got in touch with, uh, we had almost 200 surviving families in Cincinnati. And uh, we started collecting uh, objects to present to the museum. And after a couple of years, they thought it would be a good idea uh, to have a speaker's bureau and to go out into the community and speak about the Holocaust, make people aware of what had happened, make children aware. Uh, children didn't know, American children knew nothing about the Holocaust. But we thought we were going to save the world because if we got to the children, <coughs> Excuse me, could you get me a Kleenex? Uh, wait a minute. In, no, in this bathroom, there should be one. I'm sorry about this. Oh, one. I dragged a bunch, sorry. <laughs> No, we, we really thought that we had to make the world aware of what had happened. Americans, you were so far away from all this. How were the children to know anything? Even my own children didn't know. They didn't, they knew I was saved, but we never talked about it. So that's when we formed the Speakers Bureau, and also uh, we started teaching a teaching program for teachers. We taught them the Holocaust. Then they went back to their schools and they taught their children about the Holocaust. 
Then we, the speakers, followed with our own. We didn't try to teach them the Holocaust. We only wanted them to know who we were, where we came from, what we endured, and what can happen if a country opens their arms to you and gives you the chance to, to make a life for yourself again. And we thought, oh, we'll save the world. This will never happen again. Then came Darfur. Then came other atrocities. And there's no end to it. And we'll be gone. I mean, I'm 90 years old. And from three or 400 survivors that belonged here, we only have maybe 10 or 15 left. So uh, it's a shame. Now we do have, I do have some tapes. I've made tapes of my speech. And uh, who knows? Your story, uh, yeah, we've made tapes and we have the museum. Your story will live on. It go on, but it's different. You know, it's, when you stand in front of 50 children or 100 children or 400 people, it, you realize that you, you've touched a nerve, if not all of them, in some of them. And you hope that um, maybe not this year, maybe next year, maybe in 20 years, someday, maybe. I agree. It's different in person than on video. Um, talk to me about your relationship with Maybell now. Do you guys hang out often? Um, yeah. Well, over the years, um, <laughs> it's interesting. I happened to marry into this family. I married the fifth or sixth cousin. And they were not very friendly with this particular cousin. So we really lost touch for quite a few years. And then I, I divorced after 29 years. I divorced and I remarried. And then we resumed our relationship because they weren't upset with me, they were upset with my ex-husband not with me. So then we kind of resumed our relationship. And by that time, the only one that was left was Maybelle and her children. All the cousins were dead. The original were all gone. Their children were all over the United States. So Maybelle and Leon were the only ones left of the original huge family. And we started seeing each other again and calling each other and talking about our children. And then we ended up here. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. It really is. Yeah. And she's 96 and she's beautiful and she's smart. And we just, you know, we have lunch together sometimes, we have dinner together sometimes, and um, we very seldom talk about the past. We only talk about our children today, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. In fact, one of her uh, great-grandsons was supposed to, uh, he was asked to do a, a paper for his class, all of them, on some subject or other. And he decided he, want, he didn't want to do that. He wanted to do a story, my biography. I've never met this child. And he called me and wanted to know if he could come and interview me. And the teacher said, no, you can't change the subject. And he said, well, then I'm not going to write about that. I want to write about my family. And she finally gave in and she said, OK. And he did. He came, he interviewed me, took pictures, and wrote the story, and got an A+. Plus. <laughs> 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 so. <laughs> Amazing. Um, 
last question. I won't want to keep you too long, but you said you and Maybell don't really talk about the past. Why is that? Is it because it touches a nerve, or is it because you no. have things to talk about? No, actually because we were ashamed of being refugees, survivors. Survivor was a dirty word at one time. I mean, you know, you survived and your family perished. How dare you survive? And then the ones who did survive, in America, you were a greenhorn. That's what they called us, greenhorns. You weren't anything very viable. You didn't speak English. You dressed funny. I mean, we didn't want our children to know that we were survivors. You just wanted to but they them. knew. They knew. Their grandparents were survivors, and mother is a survivor, but we never talked about it until, well, until the Holocaust uh, Museum opened up, and then we all came out. That's a long time huh? to keep those memories suppressed. And my children were never really into it, even today, but my grandchildren. And my great-grandchildren are very interested. Have you been back to Europe? Yes. Where did you go? The rabbi from Weiss Temple, Cameras, formed a group of 35 of his uh, parishioners to do a uh, reminiscence tour of Europe, Jewish Europe. I had a friend who belonged there. She was also a survivor. And I decided I want to go back just one time. I want to go back. I want to see what's left there. And I had heard, I don't know how, I had heard that our factory was still in existence, not the um, oil refinery, but the mill and the house were still in existence. So I, I, I talked to Carol, and she said, I'll talk to Cameras, and Rabbi Cameras called me, and he said, Stevie, we have, more, we have room. We'll take you with us. So that was a, a tour of Jewish Europe, and we went to Budapest, we went to Prague, we went to the concentration camps, we went to Krakow, and we went to Warsaw. Now, Warsaw is only maybe 150 miles from my hometown. So when we were in Warsaw for four days, I decided I'm going back. I want to see my place. And I, I had a picture of our house taken many, many, many years ago. I had that picture with me. I had the address with me. I don't know why I took it with me. So I hired a car and a driver, I don't speak Polish, a driver and an interpreter. And Rabbi Cameron said, Steve, I think somebody should go with you. And I said, no, this journey belongs to me. And we went back. I had the address. I had a picture. And as we were approaching Kanin, he says to me, do you recognize anything? And I said, yes, it's kind of familiar. Last time I saw it, I was 14 years old. But I remember that we come off the road onto a bridge and then onto a marketplace and then there's our house. He said, OK, let's do it. And as we're driving and I'm looking at the picture, he says, there's your house. And he stops the car, and there's the house, exactly the way it was when I left, except that when the Germans left, the Russians occupied Kanin. And they divided the house into seven apartments, too big for one person, you know. They're communists. They made seven apartments. Now, when we left, my mother took the mezuzah off the door because she didn't want the Germans to know it was a Jewish house. And she gave the keys 
to my nanny, who had been my nanny, who was the wife of the man who ran the mill. And they said, you move into the house, it's your house, here's the keys. When the Russians came, they evicted them, divided the house into seven apartments, gave them an apartment on the third floor. There were third flo three floors to the house. And in the meantime, my mother had been corresponding with her, with my nanny. So when we got to Kanin, uh, we went to the house and I saw, I didn't know it was divided, we didn't know that, but I saw seven doorbells and I saw her name on the doorbell, so we pressed that name and down came this older gentleman. He says, what can I do for you? And I said, does my Nanushka live here? Her name is on the bell. He says, I'm her son. And he looked at me, he said, oh my God, Stefulka. And I said, yeah, I've come back. I said, I want to see my Nanushka, my nanny. He said, she's over 90 years old. She doesn't remember anything, really. She recognizes me occasionally. But if you want to see her, come on up. We're on the third floor. So I went up there, and I went in, and I saw this old woman with a babushka and a, oh, something on her knees, and she's rocking, and she's humming. And he walks in, and he says in Polish, Mama, Stefuka's here to see you. And she just kept rocking and rocking. And I said, I want to go in and talk to her. He says, she won't know you. I said, but I want to touch her. She was my nanny. He said, OK. So I went in, and I walked around to the front of her rocker. And she's rocking and humming. And I put my hands on her cheeks. And I said, Nanushka. So she says, Vulka. She stopped rocking. For one moment, she looked at me. And two tears came down. And she went, Boże moje, oh my God. And it was over. She went back to rocking, and that was the end of it. For one moment, she recognized me. I said, OK, now it's finished for me. Now it's finished. And I left, and I'll never go back. It is. It, wow. was, it was an, an unbelievable moment.